Okay, uh, it looks like the numbers are stabilizing, um, so I'll kick off. Um, well, welcome everyone to today's Land Condition Early Career Network event. This is a joint event between the Institution of Environmental Sciences and Midlands Land Events, or MIDDLE. Um, this is going to be focused on signposting soils and stones management guidance. Um, the importance of soils is becoming more widely recognised, with soils moving up the agenda for many stakeholders in the land condition sector. For people making decisions about soils at the project level, it is vital that the changing legislative landscape and guidance is understood to enable sound environmental decision making that is compliant. Therefore, this webinar is going to be focused on introducing key guidance and legislation related to soils. Uh, and we are really delighted today to be joined by three expert speakers to explore this topic. I will introduce each speaker before they present. Um, but just before that, a reminder that, as always, there will be a chance for questions at the end of all of the presentations. So please do submit these at the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen at any point during the presentations. Um, and if your question is for a particular panelist, uh, please do put their name in the question. Um, and these will then ask, be asked on your behalf later on. This webinar is also being recorded and will be made available on the IES YouTube channel and website. Thank you so much for logging in. It's great to see so many of you here today. Um, and I'll now introduce our first speaker, Jonathan Atkinson. After 34 years in the Environment Agency and the Count Kent County Council Waste Team, Jonathan has recently moved to work with Claire an industry-leading organisation dealing with best practice guidance and frameworks for positive materials management on sustainable development sites, enabling land contamination issues to be dealt with comprehensively. Thanks so much for joining us, Jonathan. I'll hand over to you. So today I'm going to focus uh, predominantly on the uh, Society for Environment uh, 10 Principles of Good Soils and Stove Management, which I've been working on with many colleagues across the different sectors. Uh, as we look at uh, soils as a sustainable resource and how we can use that, that framework to encourage uh, others to, to sort of change their view and change their mindset uh, in accordance with the, um, the Environment Improvement Plan, where we're definitely asking everybody to think of soils as resources rather than as waste to be disposed of. Um, so just harking back to the Soil and Stones report that was produced by the Society for Environment in 2021, and this, we've got some quotes there on screen, uh, which um, you can all see. I'm not going to repeat them all, but obviously the issues about how we manage soil have been going on for several years. And even back in 2017, Michael Gove, the then Environment Secretary, stated that we were only 30 to 40 years away from eradication of soil fertility in our agricultural setting. Uh, and certainly globally, uh, agricultural forestry and other land uses have accounted for a significant amount of greenhouse gases as we kind of look at um, the way we use soil uh, and, and, and um, use it for food growing, particularly in the past, we've ended up releasing an awful lot of greenhouse gases from our soil interactions, uh, as well as losing fertility in soil by, by, by adding so many chemicals to it or treating it in a manner that, that has meant it's become more dirt than a valuable living natural resource. Um, the issue on carbon I will touch on in a little bit of time, but uh, you know the, the UK soils are a huge carbon store, um, which is significant. And I think we therefore need to think about soils in the context of climate change, as well as just in the context of soil resources themselves. Um, the support for the Soil and Stones report was across the piece, and we had lots of uh, different organisations uh, under the SOCEV umbrella involved with it. So it really comes with a, some really strong credibility. Um, but the key dilemma, dilemma we're looking at, as I say, in terms of climate change is this adaptation versus prevention issue. Uh, and we'll see as we go through this presentation how soils fit into that. Um, we may not yet have done enough to address climate change and the biodiversity loss that has been much in the news recently. Um, adaptation may perhaps be an, a preferred option because this gives greater opportunity to work within the, the economic situation by providing new infrastructure for the things that we need to do. But you can see how the, the, the on, this is an ongoing debate, but just looking at that graph, you can see a small shift can make a significant difference uh, as to whether we end up with a climate that's gonna become fairly unbearable and very difficult to manage for everybody all around the world, or whether we end up with something that we can actually cope with. And as I say, in the past, we've perhaps thought of soil as just something to grow crops in or something that's contaminated that we need to move out of the way or earthworks along an infrastructure project. It's just muck. Let's get it out, out of the way, move it along the line, dump it somewhere else. 
actually, uh, fundamentally, we've missed out that soil offers a whole load of functions that we need to fully understand. And just in terms of that carbon issue, uh, the organic content in, in, of, of the planet's soils could offset 100% of all greenhouse gas emissions going into the atmosphere. If we just increase the organic carbon content of our dirt that's that's become the, the, the background to a lot of soils uh, with, with more organic content. How we do that is obviously uh, the key $100 question, but you can see in terms of the impact on biodiversity alone, uh, if we don't actually sort of manage how we're going to do things, these are the sort of scenarios that we're, we're faced with. If we, if we carry on as we are at the moment, that bottom gray line leads us to a very poor outcome. Uh, if we can increase some conservation efforts uh, along the lines of what we're trying to do, perhaps at the moment, it's a slightly rosier picture, but really we have to have substantively more uh, effort put into to sort of cons conservation efforts, sustainable food production, sustainable consumption um, mechanisms. You know, we can't carry on in the in the in the third uh, in the first world. You know, using up three three times the planet's resources. We have we have to even out, and that's a difficult message, I know but one that the uh, Climate Change Committee yesterday sort of stated loud and clear when it said, actually, we've got to bring forward the targets from 2050 to 2040. Otherwise, we're going to be potentially past tipping points that make life incredibly difficult to reverse the problems. Um, so just focusing on the Soil and Stones report, um, we, we recommended an overarching need for a framework against which we could all review and improve existing legislation and regulation and practice. And we came up with 10 principles of good soils and stone management that would help address this need. Uh, it provides some common principles across all the different sectors to drive policy uh, and also hopefully to mobilize the expertise of all environmental professionals for everybody to do their bit to the end that we need to meet. Um, the princ principles are giving a quantifiable value for soils. In the past, it's just been considered as dirt or something to be that's waste that needs to be moved out of the way. Um, and, and even in sort of planning for, for new projects on greenfield sites, the actual functionality of soil and the value of soil has not really been considered. Construction has happened, soils have been damaged, tracked in, compacted, whatever. And, and then when you know, you've got to create landscaping or gardens subsequently, more topsoil has been taken from somewhere else to sort of try and create the green spaces that that development might have. So going forward, we want to preserve, protect um, existing soils. We want to remediate those that have been damaged through contamination and misuse. Uh, we want to enhance the natural soils ability as a living natural ecosystem. Um, and we're going to really present a hierarchy of options for excavated soils and stones and dredgings, making soil a consideration in all land use and development projects, as well as how it's managed in the agricultural sector setting which perhaps would come under the new ELMS uh, approach and, and other soil strategies that, that DEFRA is, is putting through into the rural sector. We want it to reach out to all sectors. So our, uh, the custodians of land, be that in the agricultural setting, forestry setting, leisure, leisure, leisure and conservation type settings, uh, or whether it's the development setting and consultants and soil practitioners who are involved with those aspects, but obviously key target audience is also the legislators because we're asking for this uh, soils framework. And this was certainly something that was in the um, MPs inquiry last week. Everybody who was on that panel basically was saying, look, soil needs to be covered in, in legislation in the same way that air, land and water is. So it's, it's really for everybody working across all of these sectors to, to grasp the principles. And we hope therefore that we will, uh, as, a, as a body of environmental specialists, interested in soil, be helping to influence policy, uh, and certainly the, the ability to input into things like the MPPF consultation recently, the Land for Tax consultation on land contamination issues, all of these things play into how we manage and treat soil uh, as a resource rather than as a problem area. So we're advocating that these 10 principles should be embedded in policy and framework, uh, and therefore in, be engaged when, when people are dealing with soil in practice. Uh, it's, and it's setting out how soil and stones can be managed um, in a framework that supports sustainable economic growth, but also underpins the practices that we need to improve soil resilience and health, because fundamentally that's the basis of, of all um, biodiversity net gain as well. Um, so, uh, you know, plants and stuff that we're talking about, nature that, that, that we're talking about improving and stopping um, going into a sort of downward trend, 
all of it relies on soil. So if our future generations are going to have any quality of life, we all need to be thinking of this from the ground up. And I know there has been argument about climate change and there's been argument about what you can do about it. And, and, and you know, this, this cartoon, I think, sums it up. You know, we've constantly got the naysayers of sort of saying, well, you know, we can't afford that. Actually, I think the IPPC recognised recent yesterday that, look, there is no option now. If we don't address climate change, then we are all in for some significant problems and we need to do it much quicker than the original perception perhaps was there. Um, yes, you know, we're not saying necessarily everybody has to go back to medieval agriculture, but we do need to move in a different direction for sustainable agriculture, certainly. Otherwise, um, you know, the whole planet is going to be in a situation of starving, not just a few. Um, so we're very much uh, in, in the 10 principles about preserving, protecting and enhancing the value of soil and stones in situ. Um, too often our activities in the past have driven soil degradation. Uh, we need to understand that, that, you know, whether it's compaction or soil sealing or contamination pollution, whether it's the acid, acidification of soils in the same way that oceans are becoming acidified by the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, whether it's erosion from activities across land, uh, all of these things and, and the misuse and, and real impacts that uh, our day-to-day -day activities have, have had on ecosystems and, and how we deal with uh, the, the environment we interact with. But there are solutions out there. You know, there is very much sustainable soil management options available to people. Alongside that, there's obviously sustainable food production, there's sustainable and healthy eating, which sort of is, is perhaps one of the drivers for food production. Um, but we need to get the policies and subsidies and everything else right as well. And in that way, we can increase the investment in sustainable soil management. We can advocate for the different approaches that we need to, to establish or re-establish in some cases. You know, there's some been brilliant books written on, on how sort of um, regenerative agriculture and rewilding activities and other such things can really significantly help. And, I, you know, I saw on LinkedIn recently just, just people highways authorities just leaving their verges and sowing them with wildfly mixes or whatever instead of just chopping them back every year you know we've got a significant difference both in terms of the look of the things but also in terms of the biodiversity that they then support so we can all play our part uh, and we certainly won't don't want, want to be continuing to sort of treat soil as a waste and dispose of it um, because it has impacts across all of these issues uh, and, and we have to think back along the chain as well. You know, we're not just changing things for the sake of the front end and the greenwashing idea. You know, if we're going to have, have sustainable systems, they have to be sustainable right down through the, the uh, supply chain. Um, and it, it's no good sort of, you know, shouting your, your um, blowing your trumpet from the treetops if, if actually at the end of the day, you're still using fossil fuels to support your, the way you operate. So we have to think about carbon se sequestration, food security and biodiversity. Uh, uh, right through the supply chains. Um, so the basic principles are the three, we want to deal with these three, th three threats, biodiversity loss, climate change, and food security. And I would add to that others that, that sort of sit with that in terms of natural flood management uh, and, and the use of soils as resources rather than as wastes and so on. Um, if we use these soils properly, then we can look at need to look at the underlying things that, that what they actually present and as i say soils are a living mechanism they offer all sorts of things and you know if you if you saw wild isles with david attenborough uh, the recent show was very much talking about how underneath woodlands you know there's this huge complex network of root systems and microbial activity um and and, and fungi and their um, microfilaments that join everything up and, and actually sort of if we don't understand how that's happening then um, we, we're not going to be able to preserve the soils that we need to preserve in our management of land we want to have a common quality so that we can understand how we manage those soils that we do have to excavate uh, and, and perhaps you know think of those in terms of being able to recycle reuse those in specific end uses um, in, in a way that's that most safeguards the resource that those uh, materials represent um, we have to understand how um, we need to look at that in the planning context and changes of land use, for instance, um, and very much avoiding this intention to discard uh, right from the early design of a project uh, and, and in, in effect protecting undisturbed soils to in, enhance their ability to um, provide the soil functions that they do. So this is very much something that the 
the rewrite of the DEFRA um, construction source code of practice has been done. We've done that within Clare. Uh, and that's that's final drafts are going back to to DEFRA to sort of determine the publication mechanisms and dates and so on. But that very much says you, we need to think about soils as a resource right up front in the project design, and we need to safeguard areas that are natural soils for green spaces uh, or, or um, habitat areas, and so on. And so protecting soils in an undisturbed state, not not just trying to put soils back to make the thing look green at the end of the development. And, and we have to think about the baseline and, and what our implications are internationally as well. It's no good just sort of taking on board uh, what we can deliver locally. If that means down the supply chain, um, we're still utilizing the planet's resources elsewhere in the world um, for, for the production of food uh, in, in an un, unregenerative and, and unsustainable way. So certainly the next steps for our, our resource management are very much about trying to integrate these issues that have been identified uh, use, using the sort of policy frameworks and, and, and some further guidance and standardization of practice, uh, along with accountability and, and professional standards in how we audit those activities and, and linking that to the financing and marketing. Uh, which is always what brings real change is, is people realizing what happens to the pound signs um, and then making sure and this is something we're going to touch on uh, I think in IES across the board is you know in, in terms of being able to recruit and so on we need to, to develop training platforms and courses that are taking us forward into sustainable use of our natural resources and protection of our natural resources going forwards and that's got to be based on good science uh, and, and proper metrics uh, in, in all sorts of arenas, but particularly in the soil arena. Um, so we want to sort of link this uh, um, to the Environment Improvement Plan that, that DEFRA published three weeks ago or so, um, which very much focused on soils as a resource. Um, and in the guidance that we've done for DEFRA, we've, we've aligned that with the, the, the REBA planned work phases of a development so that actually people are doing it a lot earlier in the design aspects as well as taking it through the, the actual practice on site and management on site. Uh, it's explaining a bit more about the science, uh, soil science behind good practice on soil management, offering some clear guidelines for each step of development. And hopefully it'll be an authoritative guide with very clear actions backed by sound science and opportunities for further exploration and reading uh, by relevant links and so on and so forth. So certainly for us, um, uh, you know, we see a lot of stuff coming together on soils at the moment. The Syria guidance will be very helpful uh, in the pure construction industry area, but we're looking at some um, other aspects for frameworks across um, all sectors. And there's de definitely a, a lot of guidance that's been issued in the last two or three years. As I say, that there's the Soil and Stones report. There's a very good Lancaster Task Force document, which if you haven't come across that or read it as yet, uh, I would very much sort of uh, suggest that you do get hold of that. Um, a conglomeration of uh, academics and, and practitioners and county councils working together to come up with good practice for soils in construction. Um, there's some, some comments that have been made through the, the sort of planning policy coming out of both that Lancaster Task Force work uh, on, on whether we should have different soil planning policy in either local plans or at higher level. Uh, and that, again, I think has been the response on the, on the consultational changes to the MPPF that that you know, we need to link up soils in the planning side as well as environmental impact assessment um, to look at these things as resources as, as much as possible and protect what we have in terms of their functionality going forwards. And we know the rural environment is changing rapidly with elms and regenerative agriculture and other natural flood management initiatives, both looking to protect soil, but also using the soil functionality to achieve the end purposes for things like natural flood management and uh, rainfall runoff. Uh, and indeed, just plain water storage, you know, we're going to face a significant problem this summer if, if we don't unfortunately carry on having some of the rain that we've had in March, because relatively speaking, our winter has been so dry to date. Um, and I, I would recommend that you look at the Wild Isles programmes by David Attenborough, particularly this sixth programme that is not going to be shown on TV, but is only going to be on iPlayer, where I think he offers some sub substantive ch challenges about what we all need to do and how quickly we need to do it. Um, so that's me done. I'm going to stop sharing now. Um, a quick race through. Um, as I said, there are all these components now coming together. The, uh, the environment improvement plan, um, the, the soil strategy, 
the elms, the, the, the shape that, or whatever that will, will uh, morph into now that the environment improvement plan has been done uh, and other aspects from um, DEFRA and other, other government departments. And I think it just behoves all of us to, to get on board with this and consider soils in the same sort of context as we have air, land and water. So that's me done and I'm, I'm happy to hand on. Thank you so much, Jonathan, uh, for that overview of the Society for Environment's work um, and, and touching on other legislation as well. That was really useful. Um, and to all our attendees, please, if you've got any questions for Jonathan, do put them in the Q&A function um, and uh, we will get on to these after the presentations. Um, so next up, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Chris Merriman. Chris has 19 years of experience working in both the academic research and consultancy sectors. He is a chartered resource and waste manager, chartered environmentalist, member of the British Society of Soil Science and fellow of the Institute of Quarrying. Chris leads a UK team in environmental permitting across all industry sectors and acts as project director for a wide range of projects, including waste environmental permitting and compliance and the designing out of waste for major infrastructure and EIA schemes. Thanks so much for joining us, Chris. Hand over to you. Brilliant. Thanks very much for that. Um, hi, everyone. Um, good to see so many. I think there's oh, 86 or so on the uh, on the meeting here now. Um, I'm going to, a bit like Jonathan, I'm going to give a whistle stop tour, um, but through uh, pending, and um, I, I emphasize that word, uh, new Syria guidance. And I, I understand from Syria that the publication is due to coincide with the launch of its online community of practice. Um, hopefully in April. So watch this space. So Jonathan touched on a wide and a broad breadth, breadth of things there associated with the whole remit of soil and soil function and its importance. I'm going to focus in a little bit more on the um, soil and aggregate type arisings from construction uh, and indeed their use in construction. And that's exactly what this Syria guide uh, sets to draw a line in the sand on in terms of where policy and guidance was at a point in time when we produced this. Um, we now know this is going to be called Syria C809 and um, keep an eye on Syria's website and their community of practice uh, in terms of when this will be launched hopefully in the next four to six weeks. So if I can move the slides on. Jonathan has touched on the government's environmental improvement plan which was published in uh, January and I thought again it was useful to just touch on this and just draw out a few of the key points that this makes about soils as a resource uh, and soil and aggregates um, as they arise from construction. Not much to say here but a few headlines and I think it's pertinent. So 58 percent of material sent to landfill in 2016 um, was soil. Um, uh, clearly, the environmental improvement plan is advocating for more careful reuse of soils and avoiding that material becoming a waste in the first place. Um, there's talk here about a revised code of practice, which I think alludes to the DEFRA uh, code of practice on the management of soils in construction, which I know that Claire is um, revising on behalf of DEFRA. And there's also comment here about potential for something along the lines of a Grombank scheme that we see in the Netherlands potentially being uh, implemented in the UK. So I think again as Jonathan said some of the context here from the EIP is quite useful. I then wanted to touch on a recent case which all of this is in the public domain and it gives a good example of what happens when things go wrong or what could happen when things go wrong. All of these headlines um, including from the .gov.uk website and from various different regional and national publications give an indication of something that appears to have gone wrong at a development site in Northumberland. Um, I think this occurred in 2017, 2018. Um, but essentially what this has led to is that the developer in question um, has um, committed to entering into an enforcement undertaking with the Environment Agency, um, which is a way of putting things right that means that the regulator doesn't necessarily need to go down the full prosecution route. Um, but it, it, just looking at the information that's been on the government website yesterday and putting this slide together, what we can understand has happened here is that about 2,700 cubic metres of contaminated waste soil was imported to this particular site and it was used to create a soil bund uh, around an attenuation pond. Um, at some point, this has been reported to the Environment Agency and they've investigated and upon inspection of the site, 
this material is found to contain uh, uh, material that shouldn't be there, uh, wood, metal, cable, rubber, etc. Um, what this has led to is an enforcement undertaking whereby the uh, organisation uh, involved was uh, required to remove the waste from the site, review soil movements and associated protocols, provide staff training, deliver a toolbox talk for site managers, uh, produce more internal policy and procedure and documentation on soil management, and also ensure a new audit procedure and reporting up to board level. They're also required to cover the agency's costs uh, and also to make um, donations to three um, of the Wildlife and Rivers Trust in the areas totaling £100,000. So when you add up all of the sums associated with the enforcement undertaking in dealing with the unauthorised use of this material on this particular development site, it's probably quite a significant sum. We're probably well north of a million pounds when you talk about the removal of the material uh, and, and, and it, purely just in financial uh, sense. Um, Interestingly, um, this is the explanation that is reported word for word in on the Environment Agency's website, and the organisation here said that its consultants had told them that it was allowed to import the soil without any authorisation. Um, so it, this just shows that the, the responsibility here and getting things wrong feeds down through all levels of, organ, of an organisation through to its advisors, whether that be internally or externally. And I don't know the ins and outs of the uh, the detail of the case here, other than the information that's factually reported online, and you can go and Google. But it's clear, I think, from looking at the day job, that there is such an ease by which people can get things wrong through um, just pure lack of knowledge or inadvertent mistakes. And I suppose the question there is, could Syria C809 have helped? So what I'll give you now is a very quick whistle stop tour through Syria 809. Um, these slides are largely those that were presented to the Environment Analyst Conference uh, in January, <clears throat> but hopefully for those in the audience here today, particularly in the Midlands, um, this may be new to some. So Syria 809 is going to be new Syria guidance on the sustainable management of surplus soil and aggregates from construction. And um, really pleased to introduce it and to also give thanks to uh, colleagues who have um, been instrumental in the authoring of this uh, report it includes Georgie Watkins, Francis Crozier and Josh Parsons. Um, so many thanks to all of those and the publication as I said is due hopefully in April uh, in about a month's time. The, the outputs here that we're talking about it comes from a research project that Syria originally envisaged in 2020 and there's just a couple of screenshots there of the original um, research project and, and Syria's brief on that. The um, project has been supported by a steering group, which quite frankly, none of this would have been possible without. Um, the steering group includes funders, some of which are the big names there in front of uh, you on the screen, but it also includes independents, uh, I think some of who I think we've got on the call today, um, and of course, all of the UK regulators and actually the regulators themselves, including Jonathan, when he had a previous hat on, have been invaluable in providing comments and a bit of a steer on some of the regulatory nuances of the guide. Um, this slide here is a little bit busy, but it just gives a little bit of a flavour as to what the Syria guide's talking about. And I think it's just worth skimming through this. What we're fundamentally talking about is natural geological materials, which may be topsoil, subsoil, bedrock material, may be contaminated, may be uncontaminated. We're talking about made ground, legacy landfill and aggregates. In broad terms, we're considering this to be soils, um, soil and stones in the same way that the Society of Environment um, Working Group and Guide does. Um, we're not going into the nitty gritty and the depth about material um, classification in too much detail, but we're trying to signpost to the relevant guidance where necessary. We're talking about how to deal with these materials and how to use these materials through a range of different approaches, protocols and regulatory instruments. We're talking about when, when to think about it, when to apply for these uh, and when to um, consider materials in a project. And in terms of the types of projects and sector, well, you take your pick. I mean, Syria is obviously focused largely on the construction sector, but this guidance 
um, can equally be used by a, a number of other sectors, whether it be water, energy, minerals, waste, or other developments. And it doesn't really matter whether it's a single one man band or one person band building their own house and wanting to do the right thing to something as significant as HS2 or lower Thames crossing. Um, Jonathan's touched on a few of these points already, and I think they're important to reiterate is that as an industry, we do need to remove ourselves from the term muck and muck shifting and try to consider surplus soils and aggregates as a valuable resource. Um, there's opportunities for adding value to both land and projects if we do that. However, the designing out uh, and management of surplus soils and aggregates from construction can have its complexities and often it's overlooked at the planning stage. And unfortunately that makes things more complicated if it's not thought about early. And as we've seen from that case study that I presented a couple of slides on at the beginning, if you get things wrong, it's not great. Um, consequences, as we've touched on financial, whether it be fines, proceeds of crime, landfill tax, uh, claims from HMRC, HMRC or even uh, charitable donations under enforcement undertakings. Um, there can be custodial uh, sentences if things are deliberately um, done in, in, in breach of the law uh, and if the courts decide that that would be appropriate. Certainly there's a reputational risk um, as we can see from the publicized case study earlier on and also you know risks to project program cost and clearly there's no benefit of doing things wrong in terms of environmental benefits, the sustainability agenda and the circular economy. It's also important to note that legislation has expanded in recent years to, in, to make sure that anyone in the chain, the duty of care essentially, um, responsible for the handling of materials uh, can be pursued through legal channels. And this includes company director, companies, directors, site managers, individuals, technically competent managers and indeed consultants who maybe provide advice, uh, whether knowingly or unknowingly incorrect. So to delve a little bit more into the Syria guide, and this, as I said, will just be a very high level overview. It's a guide that brings together and seeks to summarize existing guidance in a clear and accessible format, but does so hopefully in a way that in bringing together that plethora of information that's already out there online, it makes it more accessible to people like myself as a consultant, uh, people within organizations, right through to people on site who may have a, a broad or, or high level understanding but want to know a little bit more about a particular activity. Um, there's a lot in it. It covers England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland and it discusses both on-site and off-site reuse option. And um, when we started this project, I think there was a few people were surprised about how much there was to try and collate and touch upon. And the main document itself runs to some 280 pages and there's over 100 different pieces of um, UK guidance and legislation and probably the same number um, for the devolved regions as, as well. And in trying to put some sense on the best what best practice looks like in terms of aspects like waste classification, there's, it runs to 35 pages there as well. So it's a large document, but as you'll see, and as we get onto a couple of other slides, it's accessible, hopefully, to be able to pick into the relevant parts that you need to see uh, based upon a particular activity or scenario and supported by case studies and worked examples. And um, in due course, as the Syria community practice evolves, um, it will be clear that this is going to be a work in progress, something that will hopefully evolve and become um, more of a live document in the fullness of time. The intended audience is anyone really who is required to understand and manage surplus soils and aggregates from construction regardless of scale and it's primarily aimed at those with strategic project level or site responsibility um, and ideally to change behaviors for those that are th that should be thinking about materials and soils at the early stages of a project i won't touch on this too much i just took the report and plugged it into an online word cloud to see what words fell out and clearly you know, we've got words like resource and sustainable and uh, environmental matters coming out here. But I think the key thing that we want to try and avoid, and it says it over on the right here, is to stop using the term muck or muck away when we're talking about materials. Instead, we need to view soil and stones as a resource for both sustainable and economic growth. Um, going into a little bit more detail of the structure of the guide, um, this probably makes things clearer. Um, 
there's some preliminaries at the front end and then there's also some introductory sections that talk about definitions and background and how to prevent a surplus and the how to prevent a surplus is, is really quite key and actually this will point out and it does point out to existing guidance that's already out there and provides a high level summary of what good practice in that respect looks like but then assuming a site activity or individual generates or needs to use surplus solar aggregates either from or in construction we then split out into the devolved regions of the uk and the, the respective legislation uh, and you can essentially see we split out into the various different options so for england and wales we give a high level overview of the options we then talk about exemptions low risk waste positions and regulatory positions quality protocols the clear defini definition of waste code of practice environmental permits and disposal to landfill in some way but not quite in order of the waste hierarchy but that's not quite the case it doesn't really do it justice here but in certain sections such as the clear code of practice and environmental permits these sections do run to quite a number of pages 20 or 30 to really drill down into the detail we've then got closing sections which again it doesn't really do it justice here but there's a lot of information on what good practice looks like in practice um, worked examples and the consequences of getting things wrong and then in the appendices there's a lot more meat um, than actually this makes out there's 15 or so case studies or worked examples there's sections for each of the devolved regions of the UK um, giving more information on legislation policy and guidance and these are quite substantial sections uh, and then quite a significant um, appendix on waste classification which refers specifically to WM3, but also to other good guidance that's out there from um, the Construction Industries Council, from the AGS and various other different organizations. In terms of the look and feel, what we've tried to do um, is keep things as accessible as possible with use of call out boxes, flow charts, checklists, graphics, and hopefully easily access accessible uh, reference and further reading sections towards the end of each of the reports uh, of each of the sections this may evolve slightly as Syria get this towards final publication but this has been the general approach that we've aimed for um, case studies and work examples I've touched on I think there's 12 uh, at this point in time and I know Syria will be keen to uh, secure more case studies work examples and indeed thought pieces for its community of practice but this gives a, a general feel as to what some of the case studies and work examples look like. This one is specifically for the site of origin scenario under the Clare Code of Practice. And the key here is to try and keep it accessible, again, with flow charts. Not necessarily saying that the flow charts are absolute because there's a lot of grey areas when it comes to soil and stones, but hopefully it gives people a bit of a guide as to what procedures and thought processes they should follow. As I said, some of the appendices are quite heavy when it comes to the detail of legislation and guidance, and we don't shy away from providing that detail, but we provide that as an appendix so that the main document doesn't get too bogged down. So that if you really want to do a deep dive into some of the legislation uh, and some of the um, original source guidance, then you can indeed do so. Waste classification is a big section, and my co-author, Georgie Watkins, uh, takes all the credit for this. Um, We've got 35 pages um, which distills the essence of the WM3 guidance in a way that I don't think has been done before for soil and stones. Um, and again, it's trying to present it in a way which is clear and accessible and hopefully user friendly. I don't I think it's important to stress that when it comes to things like waste classification, that this is not trying to be a substitute for knowledge and training, but it, it relies upon people with some background in this area, but hopefully would provide them with a little bit of a guide that uh, may otherwise be absent. We try to draw out on a lot of watch points uh, and common mistakes within the document embedded within the text. Again, in hopefully easily accessible text and, and format. So we've got some examples here of the importance of factory production manuals when we're considering the aggregates protocol. Um, the aggregates protocol often referred to as a wrap aggregates protocol incorrectly um, there's a requirement to include factory production manuals. There's other common mistakes here about quality protocols and evolving issues of matters that uh, are being discussed through task and finish groups that we yet to have sight of. In fact, a lot of common mistakes. Um, so we do not shy away from providing quite a lot of red text where there are um, common mistakes in industry about various different 
uh, waste uses or approaches, um, ultimately to avoid examples such as that we saw at the beginning where mistakes are made and it has significant cost and reputational damage. Um, so that's the overview. Just to finish on, as Jonathan touched on, there's a lot happening at the moment. Um, I haven't updated this since January. I don't think there's any significant changes, but there's a lot going on. Um, no doubt you could pick Jonathan's brains on the Clare Code of Practice. There's lots of review of agency protocols um, at the moment. You've got Clare reviewing DEFRA's Code of Practice for sustainable use of soil in construction. You've got SHAPE. You've got Office of Environmental Protection. You've got so many things happening with various different working groups um, and professional organisations. So keep an eye on what's happening and do sign up to various different mailing lists. That's what I would say. And just to draw on that point and Jonathan's point, there's a lot going on. This is just literally a screen grab of different websites and different things that have been happening over the last couple of weeks. We've got serious soil community practice. We've got the IES launching new land condition guidance. We've got much happening with the British Soil Science Society. We've got some really interesting articles, um, which personally I've been sharing on LinkedIn and hopefully will be accessible to others. We've got the House of Commons um, uh, um, committee um, call for evidence and um, screenshot of the, uh, the those that partook in that, including uh, Martin Ballard on behalf of the Society and Environment the other week. Um, looking forward, you've got events like the Silk Annual Forum later this month, which is very much heavy on similar matters associated with material management and waste. And um, we've also got other sectors, the mineral sector, talking about its role and its contribution to recycled aggregates. So there's a lot going on there. Um, and revisiting the first slide or one of the initial slides about the environmental improvement plan, my personal view is we're just at the start. 2023, things seem to be happening and seem to have, have happened over the last 18 months. I think with the environmental improvement plan and various things like SHAPE moving forward and all the initiatives by the various professional and learned societies, I think we will be on a journey to change by the time we get to 2030. I don't know exactly what that looks like, but I really would encourage everyone to very much think in their own projects and their own works about soils and aggregates um, rather than a waste, but as a valuable resource and to start thinking about those materials early. Um, so I think that finishes for me. And again, be happy to take any questions along with uh, the others today. Thank you so much, Chris, for that presentation. Really interesting to hear about the Syria guidance. Sounds like it's gonna be a really uh, useful resource um, and a look over everything going on. Um, if you could just stop uh, sharing your screen. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and as you said, uh, please, uh, all attendees, do put any questions for Chris um, in the Q&A function. Um, so finally, I'm pleased to um, introduce our final speaker, Kevin Goldberg, uh, who is joining us from Canada today. Um, Kevin began his career working for a company handling liquid solidification on subway tunnel spoils. After experiencing the pain of handling disposal paperwork, the Western University Environmental Engineering grad began exploring a venture to solve this problem. Them. And in 2019, he and a fellow engineer started Soilflow, a software that enables users to manage the movement of excess material across construction projects. Thanks so much for joining us, Kevin. Over to you. All right. Thanks for having me. I'm going to share my screen here. And I think you can see that there. So thank you, everyone, for joining. And it's uh, great to hear the previous presentations to give some backdrop on kind of the regulatory uh, framework ahead of us that's coming and where we are today. Um, where I come in, I think, is really on the practical implementation of the different regulatory requirements you have to follow, guidance, whatever it might be, or even sustainability practices. So just, I mean, you, you already got a bit of the intro on me, but we started back in 2019 dealing with this issue ourselves. Um, we started in Canada, we're active in the United States, United Kingdom, and Australia, really just those areas that have highlighted soil reuse as an important uh, requirement for sustainability, and the industry is following those practices, or at least trying to. Since then, industry-leading house builders, heavy civil contractors, and environmental teams have adopted our software to manage various aspects of their sites, really ranging from small utility jobs up to major infrastructure projects, uh, subways, trains, uh, major roads projects, big condo excavations. 
Our reach today, we work with over 140 companies with 200 monthly active projects. And uh, last year in 2022, pretty proud to have tracked 8 million cubic meters of soil, which really uh, tells us a lot about sustainability, uh, gives us a lot of information on the best ways to uh, reuse different soils, taking away the mindset from muck to soil and working with our different clients and in industry uh, to really prepare for kind of the next generation of circular economy when it comes to construction materials. So where did we really come from? Why are we in the UK? How did this all start? Well, um, for those who haven't been to Toronto or Ontario, we're one of the largest growing construction cities in the world. Um, and really in any dense urban population, when you're displacing enormous amounts of soil, inevitably people look to cut corners, save some money and soil gets dumped illegally. So we actually went out to the world market and said, okay, who is tracking soil today or who has a soil regulation and our government really latched on to Claire um, and other parts of the UK industry and modeled our regulation after uh, after those Claire guidance requirements really. They took it one step further uh, and kind of made it a mandatory regulation to track your loads of material. This is where I kind of came in and I was stuck with uh, those loads of paperwork down at the bottom thousands of tickets looking to reconcile. Now, when we look at material tracking, I kind of made this definition up myself. You won't find it in Oxford English Dictionary. What I see material tracking as is the collection of accurate, keyword is accurate, information on the movements of materials reused as well as in and out of a project area, including haulier info, material information, chemical and geotechnical, the times and location. Now, when looking to collect this information, most people might be uh, familiar with a paper method if they're doing it at all. So the typical way it works is we record this load information uh, manually on some sort of paper manifest or ticket, whether or not that's the person in the field, that's the truck driver or the receiving site. Uh, typically, I would say 90% of new markets we see, and I mean, through my research in the UK as well and my experience there, it's all done through paperwork. We then have to collect this information and bring it to the back office. So we're chasing down the different field managers and you know hauliers for records. And then we need to reconcile this data across all the different parties. So you'll typically hand that back to your environmental consultants um, or whoever it might be. Maybe you're doing it yourself or you are the environmental consultant and you spend hours trying to make some sort of sense of what happened on that site and where that different material may or may not have gone or is going. So, I mean, this is all great in theory, but typically we see a few pain points uh, when it comes to manual paperwork and reconciliation. First of all, there's a lack of visibility and information into your actual site. So many people on this call might deal with complex sites. You might have stockpiled inventory of surplus soils. You might uh, have different excavation areas with different soil types and materials. You might have different samples uh, between your different areas, which kind of change the, which change the quality of the soil and where it can go. Really, this lack of visibility not only might lead to you know issues like Chris showed us in the previous uh, in the previous slideshow with accidental illegal dumping on purpose, who knows? Um, but it at least to delayed projects because we're waiting on people to tell us where the soil can go. We're waiting on um, understanding if we've gotten our number of loads in. So it goes beyond that environmental aspect and really comes into that logistics aspect as well. There's administrative overburden, so a tremendous amount of repetitive manual entry with little data standardization. Ultimately, these barriers and these costs um, lead to avertable labor costs and inaccurate data. And it also makes it so people don't want to track their information. What's the point in doing this? It's never accurate anyways. No one's checking it. Why do I need to do this? Increasing compliance requirements, of course, uh, as we've seen in the last two presentations, you know, additional rules to follow, more data to collect than ever, uh, leading firms to new liability exposures, as well as the industry as a whole, and of course, increasing costs with that as well. So typically our clients' goals and how we help people is 
flipping it. So accurate budgets and timelines. So having those proactive uh, site management decisions. Um, you can really see where all your soil is going in real time. That element of data standardization allows teams to become more intelligent with their soil management to understand how to beneficially reuse as much soil as possible, whether that's off-site or whether that's on-site as well. So we really encourage that on-site reuse um, and moving it from one point of the job to the other. And even in many times, you know, on larger sites, designing the site so we can keep as much soil on site as well. Um, and then finally, reducing that liability. So through having these live audit trails, real-time information, of course, that allows you to deal with any issues that may arise in real time. So uh, we're going to highlight a case study here, um, and the project is the Finch West Light Rail. Uh, it's a P3 Metro Lynx project. There's typo there. Currently under construction uh, in Toronto, brings 11 kilometers and 18 stops of public transit. Um, a multi-billion dollar project here in Ontario, which started actually prior to our regulation being implemented and was really looking to kind of take hold of best management practices leverage technology and beneficially reuse as much soil as possible, preventing it to go from landfill to landfill. So our objectives when it comes to this case study or this project really, as it was one of our first projects actually, was to prove that proper tracking of excavated soil enables key stakeholders to ensure compliance, prevent illegal dumping, enable beneficial reuse for the circular economy, and ultimately reduce any costs associated with soil management as well. So we're looking for that return on our investment from using technology. Um, otherwise, you know, let's just use the paperwork and reconcile it as much as we can. The challenge when it came to this project, it was twofold. One is they had to comply with these new soil regulations. So included in these regulations are the strict requirements to track and collect data on every load of soil exported and imported from the project sites. Um, the second was the project is tendered out in sections to many different local contractors, all of whom may have different methods of collecting the required information with traditionally paper-based systems. Each section is additionally delineated into multiple soil types, each of which have to go to the proper location. So the winning contractor on this job won it based off of reducing the amount of soil that would have to go off to expensive landfill or remediation facility and beneficially reusing as much as possible. So the complexity here is the number of sites and the number of contractors on the job made the collection and accurate reconciliation of this data extremely difficult and time consuming for Mosaic, if not impossible, using standard paper-based methods. So let's get into it a little bit over here. Um, this is an example of what a delineation might look like on the job over here. <laughs> Sorry. This is an example of what it might look like over here. Um, we have the different, uh, it might look familiar to people. So we have the different sections. This is just one very small component of the job. We have the different areas with some test pits and boreholes indicating uh, I believe three or four main types of soil. We have different soil classification standards um, in Canada or in Ontario, of course. So we see we have this clean soil over here. This is a moderately clean soil. And then these yellow ones are essentially contaminated soils. Uh, if we can't find really the proper home for it, uh, which would be difficult. So what we needed to do was really make sure that all the material uh, was going to each of the proper disposal locations. So there were three distinct locations or receiving facilities for these each uh, different types of soil. You know, the ones in green being the least expensive to actually dispose of, and the ones in orange being the most expensive to dispose of. Actually, I actually have it backwards, it's blue, not that that really matters. So the solution was, I mean, soil flow was selected by Mosaic. Um, so using soil flow, Mosaic had a single platform to collect all this information in real time. With soil flow reporting, the project now meets those compliance requirements and standards while also enabling that beneficial reuse. So the typical 
uh, process that would happen on a job like this is the excavator actually purchases paper tickets from the fill site. So a lot of our fill sites locally here are quarry rehabilitations, uh, what you in your industry would call landfills essentially. And people go and they purchase tickets for those various landfills up front, actually. So normally they would go and they would collect those tickets. They, they would enter the information on that ticket and hand the ticket to the driver. They would fill that information out there. The driver would take the information, bring it to the fill site. They would take their piece and fill it out. And somehow we had to reconcile all of this information and at the same time ensure all the trucks went to the proper location, make sure that we had all the information for recording. And then, you know, if there was a problem, know in real time or being able to deal with it effectively to resolve that problem. Um, ultimately, some of our jobs are moving in the millions of cubic meters when we're dealing with hundred, you know, hundreds of thousands of lorry movements, um, there is inevitably going to be a problem, technology or not. It's about knowing that that problem happened in real time. The way it works on soil flow is the fill site actually allocates digital tickets on soil flow to each of those various contractors. Every time the truck would leave, a flagger would dispatch the truck on the mobile field app, so they would record that that load left. It would automatically create the run sheet and distribute it to the various parties. So it would record um, the hauler that arrived and the time they came, the time they left, the material that was in the lorry, who actually on site sent it, where it came from on that site, as well as the type of material based off of that delineation. So they could say it came from this section over here. Soil flow knows automatically that that section might be clean soil and registers the proper information with the proper documentation attached to it as well. Controller then receives all of that information right to the back office from a commercial perspective. Environmental teams have access as well. Logistics teams are able to see progress of excavation and so forth. And all the truck lo loads were logged in the soil flow database for reporting um, for up to seven years down the line. So we've actually been working on this project for uh, four years now. And we're finally coming to the close of it. And when it comes to final reporting, they're simply pulling a report over the past four years. It takes them all but 30 seconds. They've been monitoring it on an ongoing basis and they can go ahead and report it. When it comes to the details that we were really able to collect, um, it can get quite granular or it could be more broad. In this situation, we actually made it very granular in soil flow. So a single site over here was actually divided into four of its own sites on soil flow, one for grading, one for piling, one for grading a different soil type, um, and a different location for piling as well. Within a site, a delineation might look something like this. So we have our total budgets that they're able to monitor on an ongoing basis. For us, the key to getting contractor and field team buy-in really comes to return on investment. So we often see ourselves as the people in the middle of environmental teams and construction teams, which might butt heads on this type of topic when it comes to their traditional way of filling up lorries and sending them off, not really having to worry about it. It's a change in pace for these various contractors. And really, we have to meet at the middle ground and show them that there is a benefit in diligent tracking of materials, whether or not that's on site or off site or imported. Usually those come in the form of ensuring they're on time and on schedule, ensuring they're not going over their takeoff estimates and cutting into their margin, which is very often the case ensuring that all of the material that is clean is going to the proper clean disposal facilities rather than accidentally sending them off to a landfill, for example, that might be very costly on top of that. Um, so, I mean, our, our dashboards, our scheduling, and all of these different components really are what marry those teams together and, uh, you know, really bring everyone to have buy-in into the process. So the results on this case study over here with real-time reporting, Mosaic could easily and quickly comply with their contract requirements. 
consultants and project owners were able to review progress on a weekly basis. Um, in reality, they could review that information on a real-time basis if they wanted to. Time and cost savings were generated from no longer waiting on paper log sheets and month and reconciliations. On-site subcontractors were able to take control of their trucks or lorries to ensure optimum output and usage. And then, of course, beneficial reuse was encouraged through diligently tracking and reporting on excess soils, saving countless loads from going to landfill and reducing GHG emissions through beneficial reuse of that material on site. Um, we firmly believe at Soil Flow that in order to you know, comply with all of these new regulations coming in, um, in order to kind of meet the new competitive requirements in the market when it comes to logistics, these teams and all the teams really around the world will have to adopt a technology of some sort. Um, it's just a matter of time. We get pretty good access and visibility into provinces across Canada, to the UK, and various provinces in Australia and states in the United States. Um, and it's really all trending in the same direction, very much you know, to what the last two presentations told us earlier in terms of these new requirements and a new standard coming into play. And really it's gonna come from the top, the owners of these projects and the governance in order to make sure that it's going well. So um, I appreciate everybody uh, joining me and listening and joining this event. It's been a great event so far and uh, that's the end of my presentation, I'll pass it off. Thank you so much, Kevin, um, for that overview. That was really interesting to hear about uh, some case studies and, and how soil flow is working. So thank you so much for that. Um, we'll move straight into the Q&A uh, session now. Um, we have lots of questions coming through, so I'll just kick straight off. Um, Jonathan, to get started, we've got what I think might be good for you, um, which is, uh, so soils only seem to feature in parts of legislation in the UK. Now that the UK is outside of the EU, what is the potential to form a significant soil program like a soil framework directive that is akin to the water framework directive? Yeah, well, um, as many of you may know, the EU is considering a soil strategy um, to take forward that idea of having overarching um, framework directive type approach to how they manage soils. Uh, and the, the uh, UK is, is taking a similar view, really. It's watching what's happening over there carefully. Uh, but the whole point of shape uh, was to look at all aspects of soil health uh, and soil resource use. Um, and so we're hoping that, um, you know, now that the IEP, so the EIP says clearly what it states, uh, there will be moves, moves afoot to provide more guidance and, and if necessarily policy direction, uh, both in terms of within DEFRA, but also, as I say, potentially within the planning arena. Uh, and maybe in the HMRC uh, land for tax arena as well uh, with, with Her Majesty's Treasury. So all of these parties across government are discussing uh, where things will fit, whether it's regulation, whether it's policy, uh, or whether it's um, statutory guidance, that sort of thing. Um, and I think we are moving in, the, in that direction here um, post-Brexit as well as, as, as keeping an eye on what's happening over in Europe on their soil strategy uh, play. Uh, if anybody's interested, the Nicole conference um, at the in, back in November that was held in Athens, there was an Athens statement on soils that was made, which, which was sort of, if you like, a steer for the EU approach. Uh, and that makes interesting reading as well. Uh, I'm sure we can find a link to put on your website if you want, uh, uh, Ethne, for, for people to follow that up if they're interested. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Um, and, and Chris, one for you. Um, what do you think is the best way to disseminate guidance and changing mindset on soils from waste to resource to site teams or decision makers in a simple and effective way? <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, the soft approach has got to be just awareness and knowledge sharing. And I think that's something we're on that part of the journey at the moment. Um, personally, I think we there should be some I think I think it would be nice to see um, I don't want to tie anyone's hands in knots but I think there needs to be recognition of materials management earlier on in the planning process so I don't know quite what um, government can do to perhaps influence national planning policy or even influence local authorities at a, a local level but in my mind you know we, we think so much about air and carbon and we think about water and biodiversity net gain the soil question and the resource management or materials management, whatever you want to call it, it seems to be lacking. I do think 
Um, I haven't had a sneak peek or anything, but I do suspect that the new DEFRA guidance or the replacement updated DEFRA guidance that uh, Jonathan and his colleagues will be um, dealing with will talk more about soil resource surveys and soil management plans. And I think it's that language that we need to be more familiar with. Um, I mean, there's, there's, there's so much um, confusion out there and maybe misuse of terminology about things like the MMPs and you know, people just see see these as catch-alls. So I, th I see it as a journey. Um, and I think the fact that there's still 77 people here today, I think that's great. And I think, you know, it is, it is a, it, it will evolve. I mean, clearly there are companies and organizations out there that um, maybe are behind on the curve. So I, I think it's just incumbent on all of us to try and encourage engagement and understanding yeah. um, short of actual policy changing in the, in the more medium term. Yeah, and I think if I can add to that, you know, the, the, the 10 principles was, was a steer to say we need policy to cover these areas. Um, and certainly the, the, the Lancaster document also talked about um, how planning policy, there are one or two councils that it, it cited as case studies who have actually got planning policies for soils. Um, and they've also got planning conditions uh, for, for so soils to be considered as a resource in, in all projects. And I think that's critical. I think a lot of the big infrastructure projects across particularly greenfield sites do do kind of think along these lines um and, and high speed two for instance is using a dowcop special type approach uh, dedicated to it uh for exactly that purpose because they wanted to sort of you know enable the reuse and recovery of materials appropriately uh in a, in a recognized and tracked manner um and, and i think um you know we're right in sort of considering that some people have got it and some people do it um, there are tools coming forward, as we've just heard about soil flow, to enable everybody to do it better. Uh, and maybe that would be one direction of travel, both in terms of perhaps policy and guidance, but also maybe in terms of the codes of practice, is that, you know, if you want to use best practice codes of practice, potentially you may have to be using digital tracking mechanisms. They're all out there. There's logistics tracking. There's, there's uh, other tools other than soil flow. Um, but soil flow has just given us a very good example of how there's no reason why somebody somebody shouldn't be using that, uh, particularly if they're wishing to maximise the use of their soils resources, having done early planning and, and um, taking account soil surveys very early on in the design of projects. Thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, going on, on to you, Kevin, a uh, question about soil flow. Um, does soil flow help match potential donor and receiver sites with particular soil types in a local area to push soil up the waste hierarchy? Or is this a service you are considering providing in the future? It's a service we're considering providing in the future. It's not even something we do yet here in Ontario where we have hundreds of sites on board. Um, at the end of the day, it becomes very complex, you know, when it comes to soil type, relationships, of course, are a big factor as well, cost and ultimately distance. So it's really kind of uh, uh, micro regions that can really work with each other and populating that becomes quite difficult. Definitely not off the table, but not something we do today. Ethne, if I could just jump in there, the Clare Materials Register already does that for the UK. It's, it's in a fairly sort of basic format at the moment, but uh, one of the things that we are looking at in terms of our improvement on IT tools will be to, to, to basically make that mappable uh, in real time. So yeah, anybody who has material should be registering it on the Clare Register of Materials and anybody who wants material should be registering it on the Clare Register of Materials. Uh, and we can put people together in that manner to make sure that these things are, are, are done. But that requires projects to think about things early on and to get those things on the register early on because that's where you then make the contacts and make the plans viable. Uh, if you leave it to the last minute, quite often it's difficult to find a receiving site that's on the same time frame. Thank you. Um, Chris, uh, why is it that you think that the panel, um, why do you think that no house builders wanted to provide consultation feedback to Syria? Uh, uh, the attendees uh, commented that it seems like many bury their head in the sand and put aside funds to deal with prosecutions rather than plan ahead, as Jonathan's just talked about, um, yeah. in terms of soils management. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I can understand where that comment's coming from. And I think similar question was asked um, either at the Clare event back in November or the Environment Analyst event. In terms of attendance um, and engagement on the Clare project steering group. So every Clare project will have a project steering group, which comprises both funders and other parties that are interested in getting involved. I mean, ultimately, those that were involved in the PSG were were there 
through engagement with 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 um, with with Syria. But you're right that you know there were, was an, a, a silent absence of any house builders and developers. Now, I'm not going to be an apologist for that sector, and I you know you could argue that for some they do what the law requires them, and you know we're not putting solar panels on top of all of the new builds in the country, and until the law changes. Um, maybe maybe things won't change. Um, you know, for some sectors or some organisations, there does need to be more of a stick than a carrot. Um, so I, the honest answer is I don't know. Um, I would like to hope, and I think they do cite the case that we um, we explored at the beginning, that that sort of uh, exposure and publicity will change behaviours. It, it's always difficult. Um, you know, I don't want to point any fingers that if an incident happened five years ago and it becomes in the public domain five years later, then you know I, I would question whether um, that organisation has maybe put the right procedures in place to be doing things better. But uh, I, I do agree that you know the house building community I would really hope can get behind this um, as one of the key producers and users of these materials. Um, like but it. yeah, unfortunately, I don't have control of of who's involved in the steering group. I'm afraid. No, I think everybody has their piece to say, but I think things like the environmental um, governance tools will will as we go into scope three we'll we'll drive others to look down the line at their supply chains and maybe that will help house house developers house builders um, change their views on some of these more sustainable practices thank you um and and kevin coming from that kind of international perspective um how have you found the incorporation of uk guidance into the tracking and is there a big difference between uk and canada in that respect um there's there's not a big difference between uh, the UK and Canada. I mean, in terms of the actual regulation, almost everything uh, is is the same. I mean, there's different parameters on exceedances on different chemicals, of course, background conditions. We're dealing with different types of contaminants as well, just based off of the history of uh, the UK versus Canada. Um, you know, the incorporation of the regulation into industry, I would say, uh, the government's kind of come out with a lot of notice, put a hard deadline here. January 1st of this year was really when the regulation came into play. Um, and owners really putting the onus on the owners of projects, whether or not they're government agencies or private industry, that has really pushed the incorporation of the regulation into industry, that top-down approach. Nobody wants to be in the news Nobody wants to do wrong by the environment. It's the triple bottom line at this point, as we've heard. Um, and then, of course, no one wants to pay the penalties or fines. So preventative is always better uh, for them. Uh, so, yeah, I think, you know, the industry is pushing it. The incorporation has been good. Um, and really, it's it's quite similar to the UK. I think the UK could benefit, you know, a bit from that top down approach. I think in many cases we have and seeing the owner members part of Claire is an example as well. Uh, but I think everyone's kind of pushing the bar higher and higher across the world. Thank you, Kevin. Um, and Jonathan, um, going back to SOCAM's uh, 10 principles, um, do you think the principles are enough? Do you think un uncontaminated soils and stones should be banned from landfill to ensure de developers plan ahead? Yeah, it was interesting. I was involved with a, a conference that, again, was run from Athens not, not long ago, and um, there was representatives of, of how we were dealing with secondary materials from all around Europe. And um, the guy from the Netherlands, basically, they, they, in the Netherlands, they have a complete ban on topsoil going to landfill. Um, I can see that that may come in this country, depending on what uh, position government take on, on a sort of strategic approach to soil and stones. Um, obviously, topsoil is a particularly um, important resource. It takes hundreds of years to develop naturally. Um, there are mechanisms to sort of manufacture topsoil, but you don't manufacture it so that it fulfills all its functionality because it takes time to, for the biology to engage with, with, with the material that might be called topsoil coming out of various production sites. Um, and that's what makes a living topsoil and a living soil ecosystem. So it, it, it is a critical um, uh, resource. And, and I, you know, I hope we get to the position of not being able to send it to landfill, because of course it can't go to a landfill because of its organic matter uh, and propensity mm -hmm. to, to produce landfill gas if it's buried um, because of that organic matter. Um, so there's a cost element attached to, 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 to it going to non-hazardous landfill. Uh, and obviously mm -hmm. that's silly when you've got a resource that could be used. So I think the idea of soil depots that DEFRA is floating is sort of hoping to perhaps 
um, correct that approach of sending that material to landfill site. Whether we have an outright ban will be very much for government to decide. I think um, just just to add to that, I mean, there's also, I mean, the, I think one of the slides I had sort of gave some statistics from the environmental improvement plan about the quantity of soils that went to landfill. Mm -hmm. But I think that needs to be split down a bit more because also, you know, you could be talking about topsoil, you could be talking about subsoils or granular geological material, whether it be uh, natural or, 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 or um, anthropogenic. Um, there's so many variables there. I and mean, of course, the mineral sector, for instance, we all need minerals, you know, we all use aggregates or minerals and a lot of those sites require uh, restoration um, back to low level or, or original levels and for a lot of those sites they require and I use the term clean and inert in inverted commas because they don't necessarily mean the same thing or what we not often think of them as but often they need material um, it's not always landfill sometimes it's recovery so there's 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 some complexities there about thinking about that wider supply chain and circularity but I completely agree if we're talking about good quality organic topsoil um, and make a bit of a distinction for other granular soil materials, mm -hmm. then absolutely, it definitely should be going to landfill, but it shouldn't, and it, it, it probably can't go to an inert landfill anyway. Um, but then I, I do wonder about some of the statistics because it, it, some topsoil medium is very useful for brownfield regeneration, landfill restoration. So I don't know, I've always wanted to sit there and pick apart some of the statistics on European waste codes and actually what really we talking about when we mean these things. Um, but yeah, in, in principle, it, it, it's we should be looking after that resource, keeping it in situ or using it as close to its site of origin. And, and no doubt the new DEFRA guidance we'll talk about is, you know, trying to protect its integrity and its texture and all the other wonderful characteristics it offers. Mm. And I think the soil depot idea will sort of pick up all of those strands that you've just mentioned, Chris, and that, you know, we, we, why are we putting good quality clay into, into landfill when actually we need it for flood defences for the future? You know, what we need to be doing is storing it somewhere for a few years so that it can be used in future projects. The yeah. same with so topsoil, the same with engineering soils, fill. Um, you know, th th there are all of these materials, they all have different characteristics, but they all have value. And, and it's, it's, it's finding that, that, soil depot, soil repository, or whatever, earth bank, whatever you want to call it, mm. approach uh, to, to sort of enabling those soils. And, and certainly, you know, in the Netherlands, in Belgium, uh, the Grombach type schemes, you, you can't send soils directly to landfill. The only soils that can go to landfill are those that are contaminated with hazardous materials that cannot be treated. Uh, all the other materials have to go through source recovery centers or, or um, for direct use uh, in, in another site. So, yeah, I think we are moving in the right direction in that. Thank you. And I, um, I guess that relates to this next question, um, which is uh, the experience of one of the attendees, which is condemning 7,500 cubic metres of good quality topsoil due to a blanket approach um, from EHOs, that asbestos made, must be no fibres detected in any topsoil reuse in a housing development. Um, yeah, I, I I'd Sorry. make two comments on that one. One is that, that people need to be more careful how they knock down buildings, because quite often it, 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 the, the asbestos is spread from the, the construction fabric uh, and the demolition uh, activity is what spreads the asbestos around into the soil mass and matrix. But um, it, that, that will come down to, to standard testing. And obviously, Claire and others in the industry on the joint in, industry working group on asbestos are, are continuing to work on that. Um, the the um, there was the sober toolbox uh, that was done last year, which helps along those lines. Um, but it, yeah, I mean, potentially any sort of strategic soil framework may, may set those sort of questions into a better frame perhaps for the future so that you're not getting very inconsistent dis decisions made and maybe decisions will be made across a, a set of relevant standards that, that are applied um, nationally. Um, but it's a bit more watch this space, further work to do. Thank you. Um, and Kevin, I believe this question's for you. Um, so you know, when you're working um, in the UK, is it correct that if you were to move existing topsoil or subsoil from site to site, that it should achieve the British standard to prove it's not waste? Um, and if that would be better coming from a different panelist. Please do. Maybe Jonathan got that one. Yeah, I mean, you can move material from site to site under that de definition of waste code of practice, clearly. Um, the, the standards will be relevant to more, the, particularly the receiving site, uh, and those soils will have to meet the relevant standard in the same way that if you're producing an aggregate under the aggregates protocol, you have to have a factory production system and, and meet a recognised industry standard for secondary aggregates. So uh, I, I think there, there is an indication that you should look at the relevant British standards as, as, as a, a sort of 
uh, point to aim for. Um, but under DAOCOP, it's basically uh, the standard that is set either by the planning permission of the receiving site or by the site spe spe specifications that are set within the project design guide um, or, or by agreement under contract. So uh, you certainly can reuse materials on other sites. Um, the issue of, of exactly what standards you have to meet uh, are more related to the site setting and the contractual arrangements and um, the, the environmental sensitivity of that site yeah. and, its, and its future use. And I think I think actually this is a uh, just looking at the question now. And I think yeah, I mean the the British standard in itself, I I don't see that as being anything that gives a guide as to whether a material is a waste or not. It's it's actually it's more about the intent and the options and the regulatory environment. This is all it's all unpicked in the Syria guide. Um, I could probably talk for hours on it, but um, yeah, I'm just looking at the question, and um, it may or may not be a waste. That's all I'm going to say actually. Exactly, um, and, and yeah. you you can use DAOCOP to 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 enable its reuse yeah. uh, if you follow it in full. And if you don't use DAOCOP and you went down a permitted route or exemption, then you know you've got other tests to meet there as well, depending mm -hmm. on the options. And it may still be a waste, but it just may not be disposal. But uh, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, and I think I'm going to pose uh, this last questions to all members of the panel. Um, I'm sorry if I didn't manage to get to your question today. Um, thanks to all the attendees for putting them in. Um, so all of the speakers have mentioned the early consideration of soils at the project design stage. Um, Jonathan, you mentioned the complexity of soils with biodiversity, soil health, contamination and geotechnical suitability all requiring consideration. What do you think is key to getting the right science into practice? And um, uh, Chris, if I go to you first. <laughs> I think it's it's a really broad field. I mean, the one thing that I've appreciated, you know, uh, coming from a geo environmental background at university 20 odd years ago, and then coming back to this now is I, I, I do not sit here and know everything about soils. I just know a particular area. Um, I think if we're looking at if this in particular question here, it's about soil skills and soil specialists. Um, I think I'm not, honestly, I mean, I, 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 I I'm exploring it myself and growing my own understanding, but I think you've got to get the right team behind you. And I think even within my organization, we're identifying that actually we need more agronomists, we need more um, soil health experts. You know, I talk a lot about material management with a more of a waste and a geo environmental hat on. Um, so I, th I, th I think it's, it's about being involved. It's about being aware of what's happening. I don't know what that means in terms of a fresh face graduate and how they find their way into this. Um, I'd be interested to hear what, what the others think. I've kind of waffled on a bit of a tangent there. Thanks. Um, Kevin, what, what do you think about this? Oh, sorry, you're on mute at the moment. I think that it's all about uh, the right tools for the right job, depending on, you know, if is that technology, is that your, you know, consultant, um, is that the people you have on staff, what area is it in, are they familiar with that area, how other projects have dealt with it and so forth. Um, that early planning is key on so many levels from, you know, ensuring you reuse the soils in the best, you know, ways possible, ensuring everything's being optimized and going to the right place. Um, not only will that do the right thing by the environment, uh, but it'll also uh, mitigate costs, which will get the rest of the industry on board um, for doing the right thing as well, because as soon as they hear that somebody else saved um, a bunch of money on beneficially reusing their soil and following the proper rules, uh, people will start to get in line. Uh, that's traditionally what I see. Thank you. Um, and Jonathan, finally. Yeah, I mean, I think that there, there, there obviously is a lack of soil specialists. I mean, I, I, I did soil and water engineering at uh, National College of Agricultural Engineering, uh, which is now part of Cranfield uh, many moons ago. Um, and soil specialists like um, those involved with environmental science and ecologists and others struggled to get into the mix in terms of the job market. And therefore, you know, there has been a bit of a sort of um, lack of those people coming through those sorts of specialisms. Um, I think now we're looking at soils in a slightly different framework and in the same way that ecologists have, have, have received uh, many more job opportunities and, and, and salary level increases over the last few years as we've come through talking about natural biodiversity gain and so on and so forth. Um, and, the, you know, the same, I hope, will happen for soil specialists. Uh, you know, previously it was engineers, civil engineers, water engineers or whatever who sort of had the core because you had water, land, uh, air, air quality specialists. You know, that was written into legislation. There was a demand for those people. 
uh, as we move into a demand for more specialists in, in soils uh, at all levels, whether it's in, in agricultural soils, whether it's agronomists, whether it's uh, soil, soil, managing, soil materials management specialists, uh, whether it's soil scientists who understand the functionality and, and health of soils, um, I think as, as things move forward, hopefully there will be the demand. And then when the demand is there, then the universities will begin to fire more people through. And I think our, our youngsters are interested in the environment. Our, 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 you know, the, the, the whole sort of Greta Thunberg, David, David, you know, youngsters love this sort of stuff um, at school level. And I think, you know, in the future, hopefully the courses will be there. And, and, the, and the people will and the demand will be there for people coming out of those courses with the relevant skills. But you see right across the board, you know, whether it's, it's youngsters going into regenerative farming, whether it's youngsters being employed as ecologists for biodiversity net gain, whether it's young people being involved with, with soil management. It, it is coming, um, but, it, you, know, you know, we're way behind the, the civils engineering uh, industry and way behind the water industry and the air quality specialists. Uh, but I think we're all moving in that direction. Uh, of, of considering you know the value of people who've done these sorts of uh, training courses um, and then we need to recruit them and uh, you know that's down to everybody. Great thank you so much to our speakers um, Kevin, Chris and Jonathan um, it's been really interesting uh, to hear all your different presentations and, and hear about the importance of soil so thank you so much for that. Um, also a massive thank you to Rebecca from Middle uh, for um, for help in organising this event. Um, and I'm just going to uh, pass over to, to Rebecca now just to say a few words about Middle. Thanks, Ethne. <laughs> um, I'll share a screen with you. So, yeah, as uh, Ethne said, um, I, I'm representing Middle today. Um, and uh, that's a forum that she's set up regionally um, to support uh, getting the <coughs> good practice guidance um, sort of accepted across uh, the industry, having a platform where all people are welcome to uh, raise their hand and make comments and ask questions so that everyone has, has a voice. Um, we aim to kind of look at the hot topics as well as um, changes that are going on across the industry to try and make sure that that uh, is available to everyone. Um, so. That's, that's who Middle is, and I'd really like to thank the speakers today for supporting uh, supporting the event. Um, I hope everyone found, uh, found it as interesting uh, to be involved today as I did. So thank you to everyone uh, for attending. Um, just uh, the final real thing to say is that um, this webinar today is a starting point for us, like we're at the starting point with soils. Uh, generally, as all of the speakers have mentioned today, um, we, we really need legislative change before we can um, sort of see thing, see real change happening. But we want everyone in the industry to, to understand where we're at and how to, to get to where we're going. So our next event will be an in-person event, which builds on what we've looked at today. Um, it will be um, a kind of interactive workshop style event um, with presentations and demonstrations of uh, good practice, tools that can help implement that good practice um, with the sponsors Soil Flow and Classify, um, showing us their, their tools. Um, and also um, the kind of overarching theme which has been picked up a lot today is the changing in mindset um, of soils becoming uh, acutely aware of soils as a resource rather than as a waste. So we've got an outside of the industry um, individual coming in to help us refresh our thinking on how we change mindsets, how we change our own mindsets and, and how we change the mindsets of others around us. So it would be really great to see as many of uh, you guys who have attended today there as possible. Um, you can follow us on LinkedIn and there'll be a poll after this event so that you can have your say on what you'd like to see at the in-person event um, and the style of the event you'd like to see so that we can make it as meaningful um, for, for all of you as possible. So thanks once again to all the speakers, to the IES for the support in putting the event on. And um, just to say to everyone, have a lovely rest of your day and, and week, and we'll see you in May at the IES, uh, at the uh, National Brownfield Institute.
Thank you very much, Rebecca. Um, yeah, and, and just to, to flag that um, if you're interested in getting involved in the IES Land Condition Early Career Network, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me and I can provide you with some more information. Thank you so much to everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Goodbye. Thanks all. Bye all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.